Chronic kidney disease is a broad term that includes subtle decreases in kidney function that develop over a minimum of three months. In contrast, acute kidney injury refers to any decrease in kidney function that happens in less than three months. Now, the kidney's job is to regulate what's in the blood. So they might remove waste or make sure electrolyte levels are steady or regulate the overall amount of water. And they even make hormones. The bottom line is that the kidneys do a ton of stuff. Blood gets into the kidney through the renal artery. And once inside, it goes to tiny clumps of arterioles called glomeruli, where it's initially filtered. And the filtrate, which is the stuff that gets filtered out, moves into the renal tubule. The rate at which this filtration process takes place is known as the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. In a normal, healthy person, this is somewhere around 100 to 120 milliliters of fluid filtered per minute per 1.73 meters squared of body surface area. This value is slightly less in women than men, and it decreases slowly in all of us as we grow older. One of the most common causes of chronic kidney disease is hypertension. In hypertension, the walls of arteries supplying the kidney start to thicken in order to withstand the pressure, and that results in a narrow lumen. A narrow lumen means less blood and oxygen gets delivered to the kidney, which leads to ischemic injury to the nephron's glomerulus. Immune cells like macrophages and fat-laden macrophages called foam cells slip into the damaged glomerulus and start secreting growth factors like transforming growth factor beta-1, or TGF-beta-1. These growth factors cause the mesangial cells to regress back to their more immature stem cell state known as mesangioblasts. And then those mesangioblasts secrete extracellular structural matrix. This excessive extracellular matrix leads to glomerulosclerosis, which is hardening and scarring, which diminishes the nephron's ability to filter the blood. And over time, this leads to chronic kidney disease. The most common cause of chronic kidney disease is diabetes. In this situation, excess glucose in the blood starts sticking to proteins a process called non-enzymatic glycation, because no enzymes are involved. This process of glycation particularly affects the efferent arteriole and causes it to get stiff and more narrow, a process called highline arteriosclerosis. This creates an obstruction that makes it difficult for blood to leave the glomerulus, and increases pressure within the glomerulus which leads to hyperfiltration, essentially pushing more fluid through. In response to this high-pressure state, the supportive mesangial cells secrete more and more structural matrix, which expands the size of the glomerulus. Over many years, this process of glomerulosclerosis once again diminishes the nephron's ability to filter the blood and can lead to chronic kidney disease. Although diabetes and hypertension are responsible for the vast majority of chronic kidney disease cases, there are other causes as well including systemic diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, which can also cause glomerulosclerosis. Other causes though include infections like HIV, as well as long-term use of medications like NSAIDs, and toxins like the ones in tobacco. Now, normally, urea in the blood gets excreted in the urine. But when there's a decreased glomerular filtration rate, less urea gets filtered out and therefore it has nowhere else to go besides the blood. And so it builds up in the blood, which is a condition called azotemia. Azotemia can cause general symptoms like nausea and loss of appetite. But as urea levels really build up, they can affect the functioning of the central nervous system, causing encephalopathy. This results in asterixis, a tremor of the hand that kind of resembles a bird flapping its wings and is best seen when a person attempts to extend their wrists. Further accumulation can even progress to coma and death. This buildup can also cause pericarditis, which is inflammation of the lining of the heart. In addition, there can also be increased tendency for bleeding, since excess urea in the blood makes platelets less likely to stick to each other, and so there's less clot formation. Finally, in some cases, someone can develop uremic frost, where urea crystals can deposit in the skin and they look like powdery snowflakes. In addition to getting rid of waste, the kidneys play an important role in electrolyte balance. Potassium levels are particularly important, and normally the kidney helps with potassium excretion. 
In chronic kidney disease though, just like with urea, less potassium is excreted, and so more builds up in the blood. And this leads to hyperkalemia, which can be problematic because it can cause cardiac arrhythmias. Another key role of the kidneys relates to balancing calcium levels. Normally, the kidney helps to activate vitamin D, which then helps to increase absorption of calcium from the diet. With chronic kidney disease though, there's less activated vitamin D, so less calcium is absorbed into the blood, which results in hypocalcemia, low calcium levels. As calcium levels in the blood fall, parathyroid hormone is released, which causes the bones to lose calcium. Over time, this resorption of calcium from the bones leaves them weak and brittle, a condition known as renal osteodystrophy. The kidneys also release key hormones. For example, normally when the kidneys start sensing a lower than normal amount of fluid getting filtered, they respond by releasing the hormone renin to increase the blood pressure. In chronic kidney disease, the falling glomerular filtration rate leads to more and more renin secretion, which leads to hypertension. Now, remember that hypertension is a cause of chronic kidney disease itself, so this creates quite the vicious cycle. Finally, the kidney also secretes the hormone erythropoietin, which stimulates the production of red blood cells from the bone marrow. In chronic kidney disease, Erythropoietin levels fall, and this leads to lowered production of red blood cells, and ultimately anemia. The diagnosis of chronic kidney disease comes down to looking at changes in the glomerular filtration rate over time. Chronic kidney disease might be suspected with a GFR of less than 90 milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters squared. Irreversible kidney damage might happen with a GFR below 60 milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters squared. To confirm the diagnosis, a kidney biopsy can be done to look for changes like glomerulosclerosis. Treatment for chronic kidney disease often involves managing the underlying cause. In severe situations, dialysis or a kidney transplant might be needed. Alright, as a quick recap. Chronic kidney disease is when the glomerular filtration rate falls below 90 milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters squared over at least three months. Chronic kidney disease is mainly caused by diabetes and hypertension, and complications include electrolyte abnormalities, toxin buildup, hypertension, and weak bones. Nutrition is important in all stages of kidney disease. Chronic kidney disease is broken up into five stages. I'm going to talk about nutrition related to chronic kidney disease for stages one through four only. Nutrition needs can vary greatly between the four stages and also can be very different from person to person. Your kidney doctor determines which stage you are in and can also let you know what type of diet you should follow by looking at things like your weight and your lab work. Again, these diet changes vary greatly from person to person, so be sure to listen to your kidney doctor for diet changes he or she wants you to make. Then, a registered dietitian nutritionist can help you make these changes. I will briefly talk about the changes in this video. But first, let's talk about what the kidneys do and why you need to make these diet changes. When you eat and drink, your body breaks all of the food down to, into very tiny parts. The body uses what it needs, stores some of the things for later, and gets rid of the waste products and toxins through the lungs, bowels, and kidneys. The kidneys make urine to get rid of these wastes and toxins. If your kidneys are not working well, these toxins can build up to unsafe levels in your body. The kidneys have many jobs. One is to remove wastes and extra water from the blood and make urine. Now let's talk about some diet changes that your kidney doctor may ask you to make. Remember, a registered dietitian nutritionist can help you make these changes. I will discuss calories, protein, sodium, phosphorus, potassium, and fluid. Calories. It is important to eat enough healthy food so you don't lose weight and muscle. 
It is common to lose your appetite slowly as the toxins build up. Sometimes people don't even realize they are eating less, which equals fewer calories and can cause weight and muscle loss. Protein. Too much protein wears on the kidneys and causes the kidneys to fail faster. So it is important not to get too much. It is also important that you still get some protein though, so you don't lose too much muscle. The foods highest in proteins are animal products. A general guide is to limit meats, fish, and poultry to the size of a computer mouse. Other foods to limit include eggs, cheese, milk, yogurt, and soy. Most foods have some protein in them though, with the exceptions of fruits. Sodium. Too much sodium or salt wears on the kidneys too. The following foods can add high levels of sodium to your diet. Cold cuts and cured meats, pizza, canned soup, breads and rolls, and any restaurant foods. And of course, the salt shaker. The sodium restriction is usually 2,000 milligrams per day. Look on labels for milligrams of sodium in products. Most of the time, it is best to make your own foods at home as you can control the amount of salt or sodium in them. Most people with kidney disease should avoid salt substitutes that contain potassium. Phosphorus. Phosphorus can build up in your body if your kidneys are not working well. If it reaches high levels for a length of time, your bones can be affected and become weak and more likely to break. Some foods that are high in phosphorus include cheese, dark colas, whole grains, and processed foods. Your kidney doctor will let you know if you need to restrict phosphorus in your diet. Potassium. Damaged kidneys cannot get rid of extra potassium. Potassium affects all muscle function. If you have too much or too little, it can cause severe muscle problems. Your heart is a muscle, so this can be very dangerous. Potassium is found mainly in fruits and vegetables, including potatoes, tomatoes, oranges, and melons. Animal products contain potassium too, like milk, cheese, and meats. Fluids. Most people in stages one through four do not need to limit fluids, but your kidney doctor will let you know more about this. This type of kidney diet can be very complex and confusing at times. However, with the help of a registered dietitian nutritionist, you can learn how to change your diet to better help your kidneys and body if you have kidney disease. There are three options of treatments you can choose. You can benefit from learning about your health options themselves. Number one is dialysis. Dialysis can be done at home or at a clinic. Number two, transplant. Some of our patients are candidates for transplant. You may be eligible for a kidney transplant. Discuss this topic with your doctor. Number three, conservative treatment or hospice. Some of our patients choose not to do dialysis or pursue transplant. We will continue medical management as long as we can. If dialysis is in your future, there are certain steps you have to take to prepare for dialysis. You will receive education attending the Kidney Disease Options class, which is also called Modalities, to learn about the main types of dialysis treatment from our team of medical doctors, registered dietitians, nurses, pharmacists, and social workers regarding your upcoming options for treatment of your kidney disease. During this session, you will learn about the various types of dialysis. You will meet with a nurse and a social worker who will provide you with information as well as answers to any questions you may have regarding kidney failure. Your doctor would like for you to attend this educational training session to learn more about your options regarding your medical treatment. Being informed about your condition is an important way to become and stay involved in your health care. A kidney transplant places a healthy kidney from another person into your body. You may need to wait for a kidney to become available as a donor kidney must be a match for your body. Not everyone is a candidate for a transplant. Your doctor will first need to make a complete medical evaluation. For a current schedule of all patient education classes, information meetings, and support groups, Call 1-858-657-7584. Meetings are located at the following address. If you do not consider transplant or dialysis as your option for treatment, there is also conservative treatment, also known as hospice care. A list of local hospices can be accessed 
via this website, as well as by calling 211. Hospice care purposes to provide high quality care to patients who face a life limiting illness. Extension of care, support, and services to both patients, families, and the communities in which they reside is the goal of hospice care. In Module 4, Health Insurance and Community Resources, you will learn what healthcare insurance you may qualify for and what are some helpful resources available in San Diego County. Congratulations, you have completed Module 3, What If Your Kidney Disease Progresses? Please check our website for additional educational modules on kidney health.